Look for the helpers, uh, Mr. Rogers would say. When tragedy strikes, look for the helpers. In the worst circumstances, people will rise up. And our souls are reminded that all is right with the world. 20 years ago, our nation was traumatized by the horrific killing of over 3,600 people on the day that we remember as 9-11. And it changed us as a nation and we still feel its effects today. Anxiety and fear invaded every part of our lives. We entered into a war in a region where previous administrations chose not to because they, did, but because they thought it could never be won. Soldiers lost their lives, some lost limbs, many suffer with PTSD. And 20 years later, we had pulled troops out of Afghanistan and the Taliban has taken over again. And we are forced to sit with painful truths and excruciating questions. Was the mistake to leave? Was the mistake to start in the first place? And I, and I say, I'm not trying to criticize. I'm just trying to describe where we're at. And here we are in the fall of 2021, and we are wearing masks in worship. And there is a Delta variant. And I listened to a report the other day that, that suggests, doesn't want to predict, but suggests because of the Delta variant and the fact that only 53.4% of the US population is fully vaccinated, that we're gonna be wearing masks well into 2022. And everybody's angry. And those who are vaccinated, and again, describing, not prescribing. Those who are vaccinated are struggling with anger for those who are choosing not to get vaccinated and it grieves their souls and its loved ones. I'm so mad at my brother. I'm so mad at my sister. They're endangering my mom. They're endangering my dad. And again, describing, not prescribing. And the basement smells like mold. And some of you lost your cars in a deluge of rain. It is Sunday, September 12th, 2021, and I declare to you in the name of Jesus, it is okay to not be okay. I wish, you know, you read in scripture about how, how folks would rend their clothing, right? Sit in the ashes and rend their clothing. That's, that works, right? Uh, and there have been times in my life where I have wanted to come into the sanctuary and just have some kind of ritual where you could just like, tear something. I actually thought, you know, rending a clothing, that might be inappropriate, let's not do that. But what if we like got a big piece of fabric, right? And then beforehand we uh, stitched across the top, just went you know, back and forth, so there's no way you're gonna get through that. And then we just cut little, um, snippets at the bottom of the fabric and then we could all come forward and take, take turns just ripping the fabric the sound of that, the feel of that right? Wouldn't that be an awesome ritual? Because that's sometimes that's where we are. So that's your homework go home, find, find a shirt that has a, has a stain on it, has a hole but you love it but you don't want to give it away rend, rend that Make, turn it into a rag and just, you know, do that ripping. And before you do, to go, oh, Lord, hear my prayer. <sighs> Today's kickoff Sunday. And Sunday school, uh, and the Sunday school begins in the new year. And this is normally we're like, yay, here we go. Last week when I said, you know, uh, give me your best Robert De Niro. I, I don't want to out the person who said this to me, but somebody says, I can do Kermit the Frog. <laughs> Right. And at the beginning of the Muppet show, wasn't, you know, Kermit, hey, you're making the great show. Woo, here we are. Right. This is Rally Sunday, you know, kickoff Sunday. This is the, hey, here we go into another year. Woohoo. But here we are. At the beginning of the lockdown, uh, I went into full blown cheerleader mode. We got this. God is good. We can do this. And then, I don't know at what point I'm like, this is not sustainable. <laughs> and I realized that people were sitting in the ashes and that my job was to sit in the ashes with them. 
And I went from being a cheerleader to being a doula, right? A doula, somebody helps somebody in labor and, you know, the challenge of that, it, that metaphor breaks down because, you know, at a certain amount of time, you know, it's, it, you know, when it, you have an idea, it's within, it's always fun to, I, I, and I won't do it this morning, like who was in the labor the longest, you know, and, uh, you know, for, for the folks who've had babies, you know, have a little competition and we can all go, yeah, good for you, you know, uh, but we don't know the end date, but do a sit with the person and, you know, remind, you know, I'm here, God is here, remember to breathe, we're going to be okay, you're going to be okay. And I don't know if I have shared this, but if I haven't, you're going to hear me say it more than once because I just think it's brilliant. Uh, the name that was given Moses in scripture for the name of God, and, and, and you may know this, that the Hebrew scriptures, there were no vowel, vowels put in. It was just consonants, right? And, and that's why sometimes when you read, you, you'll uh, read in the notes, you know, uh, meaning of Hebrew uncertain. It could, it could be one or more different words or the, the word is used so readily they're not sure. Well, the, the, the four consonants that were given for the name of God, we're not sure what the vowels were. So we, we guessed. And one way to say it might be Yahweh. Another way to say it would be Jehovah. It could be something completely different. And, and some have posited that the name of God is, is, cannot be pronounced. And that it really sounds like the sound of breath. And with every breath, we are calling on the name of God. Oh, I love that. With every breath, we are calling on the name of God. The disciples are walking with Jesus towards Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Caesar. There's a temple there built to Caesar, who many years ago gave himself the title Son of the Divine. And Jesus is with his companions and asks them, who do people say that I am? Some say Elijah, some say John the Baptist, some say a prophet. But who do you say that I am? You are the Messiah. And the Messiah for them meant an earthly king. You know, somebody who is going to make things right for the Jewish people. They were going to, he was going to restore the political fortunes for the Jews who had been living under occupation for the longest time. And they were mentally preparing themselves for that fight. You know, think about the young people who signed up in the military after 9-11, right? I will go with you. Jesus seems to speak plainly, but their minds just could not grasp what he was saying. I'm going to be rejected and die, and then I'm going to be raised again. And Peter takes him to the side, and I love this, that he takes him to the side. You know, what is, you know, what is that? Was he embarrassed for Jesus? Was he embarrassed for himself? But he rebukes Jesus. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You're thinking about earthly things and not divine things. Get behind me, Satan. The gospel of Mark does include the temptation of Christ in the wilderness, but it doesn't go into all the detail that we find in Matthew and Luke. So here we're given a glimpse of what those temptations were. The temptation is not to have to suffer. The temptation is to enjoy earthly power or uh, to be a ruler of people and nation and not the Lord of all. That's two of the three temptations. The third was to turn the stone to bread, to which Jesus answers, uh, we don't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So to be, to, to be sustained by God, that is the goal. Are we not tempted in the same ways to not suffer, to enjoy privilege or power, and to care about ourselves first and, you know, and when convenient, God? And then Jesus tells them what discipleship looks like. Discipleship looks like picking up a cross. And I can imagine 
uh, those listening could could still think that he's talking about you know an earthly you know uh, messiahship a, a a revolution. You know what's he mean by picking up a cross? Well, it, obviously it's metaphor, right? And of course it's metaphor, but what does it mean? I think it means that we have to be willing to die for him. Oh well, sure, death to Caesar, death to Caesar. But no, it means death to self. Augustine talked about sin. He talked about it, the curling in of ourselves into ourselves, the looking inward. And the remedy to that is to unfurl ourselves in love for God and neighbor and self. The kingdom of God reigns in our hearts when we love God, as we love neighbor, as we love self. The kingdom of God is about love and justice and peace of body, mind, and spirit for all God's children. Jesus' messiahship would transcend nations and nation states and empires and ethnic groups and divisions and political parties. Pick up your cross, lay down your life for love of God and neighbor and self. I started talking about 9-11 and endless war and lingering COVID. And I know it's very easy to talk about love uh, and so very hard to live it out and to know what it means because, uh, because the work of love that we are called to is incredibly difficult. It sometimes it's, it's hard to know what the loving thing to do is. It's not always obvious, it's change. it changes based on the situation and the individuals involved, but we are always called to consider what is the loving thing to do in this circumstance. What does picking up our cross look like today? What does denying ourselves and giving ourselves away to the world look like on September 12th, 2021? How do we respond to hate as Christians, as survivors of 9-11? How do we heal the trauma without causing more? Looking back to 9-11, there's a lot I could have, would have, should have that we could talk about. But let's talk about the current crisis, COVID, and again, acknowledge that not, not everybody's vaccinated. And, but I trust Christians that we are all weighing and praying, what is the loving thing to do? Wherever you fall, wherever, whatever you decide that you're wrestling with that question, what is the loving thing to do to, for God, for neighbor, and for self? And we live in a culture, we live in a culture that is bombarding us every day with you know, the, 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 the joys, the pleasures of individualism, you know, the, the unholy trinity of me, myself, and I. And but I did not make that up. I need to give that credit, credit to, to a pastor who, and I was like, oh, that's brilliant. Uh, that'll preach, right? We are bombarded every day about, you know, just taking care of number one. But that's not Christian because Jesus calls us to, Every single day, in every circumstance, what is the loving thing to do? Loving God, loving neighbor, loving self. We have a responsibility to each other. How I live affects you. How you live affects me. And, and again, and for folks who are struggling with, with, with anger, just remember, not everyone can get vaccinated. We don't know everybody's medical history, right? But we all do have to decide what is the loving thing to do. And I still maintain that we are listening to different sources of information to make those decisions. Um, it is extremely challenging in a time when you know, people don't trust experts, where uh, some people don't believe anything that is put out in mainstream media. Uh, and you know, I, I have loved ones and we have these conversations. I, I sent an article uh, to somebody and and this, and this is part of it. I would love to have, to be able to have a conversation about how we get our information. I went to a seminar that talked about, uh, about media, print media and what we watch on television. And, and I think I just, 
I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll write something up for the newsletter so, so that you can check out these sources too. But there is there is a bipartisan group that analyze media sources and they rate things from factual to propaganda. You know, what is what is just true, what is fact, and what is trying to influence, you know, paint it in a way that's going to make you take a side and they're not that uh, concerned about the truth. And then whether the sources skew to the left or skew to the right. So what is the most, so I sent an article to a loved one saying, this is from the most neutral fact-based uh, uh, media out there, according to da, 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 da. please read because I love you and I love your family and I want you to be okay. But you know, years ago, you wouldn't have to have had to do that, but we have to do that now. So we need to be talking about this stuff. And, and by the way, the, the fact to propaganda, there's like, there's a whole thing of punditry. Pundits used to be experts in their fields, um, but the definition has changed to anybody who has an opinion and has a platform. So we can watch these shows, any, any of the personality shows, right? Where they're, you know, where they're just talking does not have to be based in fact, right? And we need to be conscious of that. And by the way, I don't watch, I don't watch Fox. I don't watch MSNBC. I don't watch that, all of that. But if you're listening to just one news source, you're not getting the full picture. If you're, wherever you are on the spectrum, my daughter's here last week. She goes, are your arms exhausted after you preach? <laughs> and I said, I don't, now I, I said, I don't even realize that I'm doing it. But where, wherever you are on the spectrum, if you were just listening to one source, you're not getting the full picture. And we need to recognize that there's a difference between shows where, where somebody is, is giving their opinion without any education behind it and the folks who are experts in their fields. But let's talk about it. Jesus, all right, look, <laughs> hard stop, moving on. Jesus ends his speech with a warning about being ashamed of him and his words in the sinful and adulterous generation. And he's not talking about sleeping with people. He's talking about worshiping other gods. Jesus would ask us in every age and in every generation, are you laying your life down? What does sacrificial, sacrificial love look like in your life? The litmus test is simple. Am I loving God? Am I loving neighbor? Am I loving self? Am I three for three? So we follow Jesus, like the disciples, you know, we get hope for, rah, rah, here we go. And instead, we find crosses and sacrificial love and salvation. Because when we get out of ourselves, when we get out of our own way, when we lose ourselves and focus on others in service and in love, we have glimpses of the divine. When we have witnessed sacrificial love, we know, we know this is who and how we were called to be. And I imagine that if you tuned into to news coverage uh, yesterday, comm commemorating 9-11, uh, that you were hearing all the stories of people being lifted up who with their very lives, gave themselves away in sacrificial love and continue to do that. It's utterly and outstandingly beautiful when we witness it and when we get to be a part of it. It's love in its purest form. It gives us awe. It makes us weep. It gives us hope. Jesus taught it. Jesus lived it and calls us to follow. So tweaking Mr. Rogers, who by the way was Presbyterian, instead of look for the helpers, be one of the helpers. When tragedy strikes, be one of the helpers. In the worst circumstances, people rise up and our souls are reminded of all that is right and good in the world. May it be so in the lives of all 
who seek to follow Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.